Welcome back, YouTubers. This is Inland Northwest Native News. I'm your host, Jeff Ferguson. And I'm your co-host, Margo Hill. All Pest right. Squelks. <laughs> At least I thought you were my co-host. <laughs> All right, we want to thank you once again for joining us. Uh, it's another great day to be indigenous, and we are happy to be here. Uh, here at Inland Northwest Native News, we cover news and events for 11 tribes of the Inland Northwest as far east as the Blackbeet up to the Kootenai and Kalispells, uh, all the way down to the Warm Springs, the Umatilla, Yakima, Colville, the Coeur d'Alene, the Spokane, the Nimipu, and the Colvilles. I think that's all of them. Yeah, oh. we covered cowlets. Cowl we're yeah. Working, bringing yeah. them all so in. We do this on a national, uh, uh, we're, we're covering news and events that affect you on a national, regional, and, lo uh, and local level, and sometimes we do global. You know, there are things that are happening out there that are global, and we kind of think that that's kind of important. But um, before we get into that, we would like to invite you and to invite your friends, you know, uh, we did hit the 450 mark. We're at like 453 now. We're going to be uh, rapidly approaching 500, which is pretty exciting. You know, uh, we are kind of a super minority. And for us to do a, uh, you know, to be able to get that many followers, um, you know, we, we picked up quite a few. We picked up a couple of hundred since we started doing the, the morning show and a lot of good response. And we want to do news that's interesting to you. So like and subscribe. Uh, send us uh, ideas about what you want us to cover, what you think we should be covering. Um, there's all kinds of things happening out there in Indian country. We go out to, you know, tribal websites and communities and try to bring you news that's interesting. So uh, be sure and give us news ideas. We'll do some interviews. Yeah, let's have some fun. Yeah, let's have some fun. So uh, that being said, we have a, a slew of stories. I think we have six or seven today. Uh, so we're going to try to keep things moving along, but we have an update. Uh, let's see. Tuesday, February 16th has not been this low since October 21st. Um, that's crazy. Uh, so our, our uh, numbers are looking better uh, for the... Oh, I heard some things. Uh, looking... Um, are looking better as far as COVID goes. That does not mean it's over. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I did hear is that this is kind of off the wall, but I'm sure there's some people are, out there that wouldn't mind hearing this, um, but uh, they're voting to see if they can bring uh, Monsters of Rock back to Joe Albee Stadium. Yeah. I thought that was kind of crazy. Yeah. I know we have some uh, uh, rockers out there. I, I will be first in line for tickets. <laughs> well, maybe not first. But I would definitely be looking for tickets. Um, so yeah, that would be kind of cool. Hopefully they'll push it far enough out. It won't have to get canceled and that kind of thing. So yeah, they, um, on the front of the spokesman today, they're talking about pig out in the park, possibly hoot fest, uh, monsters of rock. Uh, yeah, hopefully we can bring all those events back. Yeah. And they're, they're really, uh, talking about the effect of herd immunity. That's a really big part of being able to do all of this stuff. And that means doing your part. Um, I know that the vaccinations are moving along, you know, Biden's on, uh, on a pretty good pace. Um, and being able to bring some of the numbers down and get the mass distribution. And here in Indian country, we are doing a phenomenal job getting our elders uh, vaccinated and getting our uh, frontline workers, our teachers, uh, all these people uh, vaccinated. So it is, it's pretty important. So one thing I did, you know, we talked a little, about, a little bit about globally. You know, um, I got this story uh, I'm going to share with you. Um, and a shout out to Andreas uh, Garduño. I think that's how you say it, Gardunia. Shout out, uh, hey, uh, and shout out to Brenda, cousin Brenda. Hey, <laughs> just checking in on me. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna try to pull this up and keep things moving along. I have this right here. Uh, Guinea confirms three dead from Ebola, first cases since 2016. I don't know what this curse is hitting in in uh, Guineans. All the pandemics are falling on us, one nurse said. So this Associated Press story, um, this ran on NBC News, uh, and this was back on uh, Valentine's Day, but I wanted to uh, share this with you. Uh, health officials in, in Guinea on Sunday uh, Sunday confirmed that at least three people have died from Ebola. That they're The first case is declared uh, since it was one of the of three West African nations to fight the world's deadliest Ebola pandemic that ended five years ago. An additional four people are confirmed with Ebola, according to a statement from the Ministry of Health. All seven positive cases attended the, um, the funeral of a nurse in, I think it's pronounced Go Go Goki, 
on February 1st and later showed Ebola symptoms, including a fever, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, and vomiting, said uh, the ministry sta statement. So I, the reason I brought that up, I have a friend of mine that I reached out to and have reached out a couple times uh, in Tanzania. And um, he's an American that's been living abroad and has a family down there, and they haven't been able to come home for over a year. And uh, I asked him how things were going. And so the reason I really brought this up is because even though we've been able to do this, we have to keep things uh, in perspective. In Tanzania, he says that the, the government there isn't acknowledging that there's a pandemic. Even though the churches and mosques have been closed and that the funeral numbers are really high, they still deny that there's a pandemic going on and they have not uh, recorded any data since last May and they are not even looking to vaccinate anybody. Wow. So, you know, it's really hard. So if you think about, if you compare that, if you could imagine what our society would be like if we didn't have a government that wasn't trying to do something, we weren't trying to get a uh, vaccine going, if we weren't trying to social distance. Um, my point really is, is we, even though we're at where we're at, this is not the only virus out there. You know, there are other viruses and we just, you know, good habits like washing your hands before every meal, washing your hands constantly, you know, to, to keep, keep them clean and, um, you know, just be safe when we go out there. Don't, you know, don't be, uh, li I don't know, licking any flagpoles. Or, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, but we just need to be, you know, we need to be aware of, of that. This is just one virus that we're dealing with. We're dealing with different strains and uh, we kind of need to prepare ourselves uh, for any that might be coming in the future. And so that's kind of why I brought that up. So anyhow, moving right along. Margot's got a neat story here. Yeah, so there are more Native Americans getting uh, appointed to key posts um, in the Biden uh, administration. So it's kind of been a slow road at rollout of appointments that, that are taking place since last month. President Joe Biden has added additional three Native American members to various departments and task force positions. In February, making good on the promise, uh, the Biden-Harris uh, commitment to diversity, on February 4th or February 3rd, we've seen that the Native American Rights Fund uh, uh, in Alaska and a um, tribal member, she's an attorney, or he's an attorney, I I'm struggling this morning a little bit, Jeff. So former attorney from NARF, a tribal member of the Chickasaw Nation, Natalie Landreth, was appointed to serve in the Department of Interior as Deputy Solicitor for Land. Landreth will serve under the first Native American cabinet member, Representative Deborah Holland of New Mexico's Laguna Pueblo, once the Congresswoman is confirmed by the Senate uh, to the Secretary of Interior. And then, uh, you know, she's notable during her 17-year tenure at uh, NARF, Native American Rights Fund, uh, of course, NARF represents tribes across the nation, uh, legal battles over sovereignty, treaty rights, environmental law. Uh, Landreth was involved in a lawsuit to stop the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline, which Native groups say would have polluted sacred lands uh, and waters in Indian country. Uh, last year, Landreth also successfully uh, challenged Montana's requirement on the mail-in ballots to have witness signatures, thereby correcting the most common reason such ballots really hadn't um, uh, been counted. And then also in the Department of Transportation, Navajo Nation's uh, former Department of Transportation head, Arizona uh, State Represent Orlando Teller, was appointed last week to serve under the Department Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg, 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 as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Tribal Affairs, uh, Department of Transportation. Teller is the first openly gay person to be confirmed to cabinet post. He resigned from his legislative seat uh, January 31st. Yeah, and interestingly enough, he is the second Navajo person to be uh, to join a Biden administration after uh, Wa Wally Johns. Yeah, well, Lee Johns was uh, selected to serve as a director of office uh, of the Office of Indian Energy in the in, in the Energy Department last month. So that was kind of neat. So um, we are getting more natives in key, key positions, and the Biden administration is picking them up as he goes along. And really, you know, if you think about how many people he works with, if he has 100 people that he works in key positions, he's already put a handful of them in there. So already good at getting good representation in this administration. I know... Um, 
Uh, Deb Holland's had some blowback, but yeah. Yeah, and President of the Navajo Nation, Jonathan Nez, tweeted, Words cannot express how proud we are of these two young Navajo professionals who have dedicated themselves to serving the Navajo people and are now moving on to the federal level to help empower all tribal nations. So that's really excited, uh, really exciting that President Biden and Kamala Harris are, are really working to ensure that the equitable response, um, also even uh, to the pandemic, they uh, appointed Victor Joseph um, to the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, response team. Uh, there's a 12-member group. They all have diverse backgrounds. Victor Joseph is um, of the native village of Tana Tanana um, in Alaska, and he was selected to serve as a non-federal uh, uh, task force member. So, yeah, it's exciting that we, that we have so many of these folks in D.C. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, it's a great time to be native. It's a great time to, you know, get... Get some things done and, you know, try to work on some issues that we've been working on for a long time. And now we're uh, getting people in there. That's really good. I don't, don't look at me, man. I'm not Alaskan to non <laughs> 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 All right. So moving right along. Oh, so that story came out of uh, Native News Online. And we thank them. They do a wonderful job. They have all sorts of different things that came out or that come out. And we just want to, uh, you know, our hands, hands go up to Native News Online. Uh, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Uh, they dig really deep to get some really good stories going. And they, they do a lot of uh, compiling of information, which is really good. So this next story comes out of, and I'm going to try to remember, this, this next story comes out of uh, Canna First Nations Radio. This is, they call it CFNR. It's by Rob Young, and it came out on February 14th, so Valentine's Day. An official and last-minute march was held uh, today in uh, Terrace, aligned with, 30, with the 30th Annual Women's Memorial March to honor murder, murdered and missing Indigenous women. The call by local organizer uh, Hillary Lightning uh, went out just the day before on Saturday on social media, and the march was afoot at 11 a.m. this morning uh, to call attention to local missing and murdered uh, women and girls. A dozen people walked, uh, masked up, and following COVID safety protocols while a few drove along the highway, uh, Highway 16, starting from the RCMP station in uh, to the commemorative pole at the edge of Highway 16 and back again. They want to remember... They, they want to remember and always remind people of the many that have disappeared uh, along that highway. And so, you know, 30 years, 30 years is a long time to be to be doing that. Um, and it's, you know, it's getting better. There are, there are things that are getting better. And, you know, for me, it's really hard to, to see this and watch this because I know there's even people out there that oppose this. And there was a story that I was going to cover. I'm not going to cover it. I'm going to forewarn you, we're going to cover it in the next one. It's directly related to this, and I just couldn't even look at the pictures to bring them up. It's kind of heart-wrenching, but just so you know, um, the next episode, we're going to get a little bit more into that because um, even though there is movement in here, there's blowback. If you can imagine blowback for, for searching for the missing and murdered indigenous women out there, that's kind of really disheartening so so we're doing you know everything we can at a federal level we've got legislation uh deborah holland has put forward legislation savannah's act we're doing everything at a state level um we have tribal leaders like uh, deborah leakinoff and mm -hmm. uh, different folks patsy whitefoot across the state and region uh, all of our states have bills in oregon um, we are working to uh, protect uh, murdered missing indigenous women uh, men and girls, uh, all of these folks, uh, when they go missing, they matter. Um, we've got folks at the Washington State Patrol, both on the west side and east side. So we're trying to do all we can to make sure that if these people are missing, that that they really are missing, um, and you know, narrow down the cases so the cops are focusing on the investigations that really need to be focused on. So it, that's good news um, that you know people are still uh, you know taking to the streets and getting awareness for the issue because then everybody pays attention and and when you see something, say something. Yeah, and so 
we're working on issues here uh, in our country, and I heard there's over 3,000 open cases nationwide. First Nations of Canada, there's over 7,000 cases nation, or nationwide that are still open. And I know that since we met with Patty Ghosh back in October, um, she had told us it was over 300 since she was appointed earlier that year. And I'm sure that number is not going down. I'm sure it's going up. I don't see quite as many posts on it like we did see, but I, you know, that just because the pandemic hit doesn't mean this issue has gone away. So that's something we'll definitely have to keep an eye on. Yeah, our, our tribal leaders and, and our tribal communities are working across youth treatment centers mm -hmm. um, to educate young people about the risks and um, things that can happen out there. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, sometimes our, our, our kids were, are lured into internet sites um, where there's predators um, and so you need to pay attention to what video games you're playing. They break the predators break firewalls and message your kids. Um, they go through get to them at music and there's all kinds of avenues now. Um, you know websites, Facebook, all the regular things, but also Snapchat. Uh, you know drugs get delivered, all that kind of stuff. So pay pay attention to your child's media. You know it really reminds me of something I remember a long time ago, years and years ago. There was a campaign. That I saw that that just simply said it's ten o'clock. Where are your kids? You know, and if we can help to just kind of go back to those values, you know, if we can help them, you know, kids need our help. They, you know, um, they need our help whether they're they're men or young men or young women because they can't always make the right decisions for themselves, um, and it's our job to help provide them uh, with with good decision making and to help them to to go down the right path. Uh, I know oftentimes. Um, kids don't always uh, understand why we do what we do and what we ask of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've gone through teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's really important. Reach out. You know, if you're, if you're concerned about them, you know, what's the worst really that could happen is that they could, you know, kind of lock up a little bit. But then sometimes they, they open up too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're just waiting for somebody who wants to hear. And uh, just, you know, an open ear can, can do a lot of things. So. so for prevention, they say, you know, keep them close, talk to them. Um, there, there's, you know, there's songs out there that's talking about mixing cough syrup. And there's just all kinds of goofy stuff on the Internet. Uh, so maybe at night, if you have to collect their phones or, you know, talk to them, keep them close, shut off the Wi-Fi, <laughs> all those different little tactics we have as parents, especially for our younger kids. They just don't have the emotional maturity or the, the you know, we're trusting sometimes as Native folks and um, we just got to watch our kids, especially with the, all the stuff on social media. Yeah, I noticed too, um, and this was something you had talked about uh, as far as transportation and mobility. A lot of times, so there's a combination of things that happen on the reservations. One, there's a lot of them don't have shoulders or sidewalks along the highways. So there's uh, people that are, you know, accidentally hit, you know, the hit and runs that happen in the middle of the night uh, are devastating. But also, you know, when we get used to that, uh, you know, walking around back and forth because of, you know, lack of uh, public transportation or that kind of thing, when, when, we move to town, a lot of times we get used to still walking and, and the streets aren't as, you know, I can't even say that they're not as safe as they used to be because they haven't always been safe, but it seems like now it, it just seems to be more open. I know this is a problem. When we talk about missing or murdered indigenous women, we can go into the hundreds, we go into the thousands, you know, we talk about that. But, uh, you know, really this is a problem that, that's been occurring since contact. It's not something new. It's just now, you know, getting more and more um momentum with this movement so uh you know going out at night just real basic thing going out at night alone um things like that you know um yeah so anyhow we'll, we'll try to move along i know we're kind of running short on time but it yeah. is an ongoing issue so so let's take a turn jeff and look at um another uh, win for indian country Mi minnesota city council gains a second indigenous voice ojibwe man defeats longtime politician in a special election so uh, the uh, Bemidji uh, City Council in northern Minnesota just got more indigenous. Dan Jordan of the Red Lake Nation won a special election February 9th by defeating a former council member and mayor. Jordan receives 524 uh, votes and Dan Larson 410 votes in an at-large council, uh, council seat race. Um, November's general election, uh, Jordan came in second to Larson with 1784 to his 2160 in a race where the two top vote getters advanced. 
With the win, Jordan uh, joins a seven-person council that uh, includes his mentor and friend, Audrey Thayer, a White Earth Nation, and Thayer was elected in November. You know, Jeff, a, a lot of these city councils, county commissioners, they make important decisions where resources go. Um, and so it's important that our Native people have a voice um, because there's, you know, people of color, color whether Hispanic, Latino, um, we, we, you know, we need to be on school boards um, and help make these city council and county uh, decisions about resources. Yeah, I know. Some of the things that I've been involved with over the years, you know, I've always kind of, I, I kind of get frustrated because uh, sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, I sometimes feel like a token Indian. You know, can you come and be on this board? Can you come to this meeting? Can you do all of these different things? And then they don't really, you know, ask about things and they just kind of wanted to tally my number or something along that lines. But, and it really kind of, that disheartened me about that. And I was like, what, what, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily, so I, re, I rethink some of the things that I'm asked to do. Um, but my point is, is that I had a tribal elder told me once, and this was Carol, Carol Evans, our chairwoman. She told me, and this was, you know, this was down in Albuquerque. I ran into her down there and uh, she was just sitting there eating her lunch. And I walked up and started talking with her. And I told her, I kind of, uh, you know, vented to her what was happening. And she said, you know, that might that may be true that you can get frustrated uh, at these kind of things but for so long indian people have never even had a seat at the table so even to have a seat at the table we may not always be heard but that is progress and and sometimes we are there are other times you know on the other side of that coin there are other times when when we're able to be heard and we can shift the whole agenda we can shift yep. the whole perspective on everything when it comes to just all sorts of different things um land acknowledgments yep. um when we look at you know cultural perspectives and and uh just things along that line so if you get a chance like they, this young gentleman mm -hmm. he got a chance to get on city council and in minnesota uh, that that's significant very significant he can represent uh, not only his people, but other urban natives and, and uh, regional natives, too. So pretty Yeah, cool. uh, 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 Jordan said, being Native American growing up in a city seemed rather daunting, um, but now that's just the norm. Um, it goes to show that no matter who you are, if you work hard, good things will eventually occur. Um, so Jordan, who's 35, and Thayer, who's 69, were part of a recent wave of indigenous candidates seeking public office in the Bemidji area, Two other candidates ran for council and two ran for county commission, one being an incumbent, uh, Tim Sumner, Red Lake Nation, was reelected to the five-person commission in November. Yeah, pretty yeah, neat. Really cool. Yeah. So we are being seen uh, across the country in city councils, in county commissions. Uh, you know, here in Spokane, we've been represented at the planning commission, at city council. So mm. it's exciting to see um, that our voice is being heard. Yeah, and it's neat to see people that you might not think would would show up at these to represent Indian people. Um, that's always neat, you know. So don't be afraid to to step up and and get out and you know uh, be heard. You know, you may not have a lot of experience, and sometimes it can be intimidating. But you know, um, I, I say this a lot, and I wholeheartedly believe this. Not just us, but all Indian people. We come from strong bloodlines. You know, they say that, that when you go through challenging times, your ancestors are there with you. And if you just, you know, if you believe in what what your ancestors believe because they survived and they were, uh, you know, a strong enough bloodline to make it to bring you here. And over and over again, I say we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And so if you, yeah. you know, if you're debating whether you should get on that board or if you should go, you know, run for that office or whatever, you know, really... What, what's the worst that could really happen? You know, we're, we're all here. You know, we're here for a short time, not a long time. <laughs> and, you know, we might be able to make a dent in the, the universe. And, you know, so anyhow, yeah. uh, that's my soapbox. <laughs> all right. Well, move. let's get on, brother. Right. Okay. Um, my next story, we I want to talk about Mariah Bahi, a 16-year-old uh, fighting to become a, a prominent Native American Olympic boxer. So this, again... Um, Forbes magazine, Sports Money. Um, in many ways, uh, Mariah Bahi is like other 16-year-olds. She loves spending time with her family, watching movies, stops by Starbucks um, whenever she heads to town. But she also is the United States' top-ranked 
junior boxer with six national titles under her belt, and she won't stop until she <laughs> achieved the dream of becoming the first female Navajo boxer to win a medal at the Olympics. So Bahi's story is amazing, um, and, it, and it's going to be chronicled in an intimate uh, detail in a short documentary from the Olympic Channel that premieres Thursday. Uh, Mariah, a boxer's dream. So this is so exciting. The film documents Bahi's life living on the Navajo Nation, the largest reservation in the United States, uh, follow, following <clears throat> through her national silver gloves victory. Uh, that's from 2020. She continues to conquer challenges in pursuit of her Olympic dream. Uh, Bahi comes from a long line of boxers. Her grandfather, Jay Cal uh, Bahi, a U.S. Marine, began boxing at 15. He started out at what was then uh, the Damon Boxing Gym under coaching under the coaching of his uncle, Lee Damon. Cal Bahi turned to coaching after Damon's passing in 1980. So six years later, Cal Bahi opened the Damon Bahi Boxing Gym in Chinle, Arizona, teaching boxing to his children, including Mariah's father, uh, John C. Bahi Jr. Today, uh, today Bahi is the head coach at uh, Damon Bahi Boxing. So big shout out to Mariah Bahi. Uh, let's look for her at the Olympics. Yeah, that's pretty neat. That's pretty exciting. Uh, we'll definitely have to keep an eye on her. And man, I could not imagine that that dedication and that level of commitment because you know, bo boxing's it's tough, man. Got to take a hit. Holy cow! It stings, and you got to keep going, yeah. right? And be thinking and moving. Yeah. You just get welled on in practice, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you know. Take a beating just at the practice. Yeah. yeah. So that you know, good luck. We raise our hands to her. Uh, we'll be watching the Olympics. That's exciting. Definitely exciting news. Um, we have, real quickly, we had a request, and we're going to have to follow up on this. And this is kind of interesting. We had our buddy Irv says, hey, uh, maybe an update on Fukushima. The problem has not gone away. They put up a tank farm uh, to store radioactive waste, and another earthquake could destroy those, and all that water will go into the ocean. So, um that's people, whoa, what's that got to do with Indian country? Oh. It has plenty to do with Indian <laughs> country. When I was over uh, in Forks, when I was over on the coast, they had that chunk. It was a huge dock that showed up from Fukushima all the way across the Pacific Ocean. And it was right there, I think, on the, was it on the whole River ancestral land? It was either Whole River Tribe or the Quileute Tribal ancestral lands over there. And they had to figure out what to do with this giant radioactive dock. And so we have all sorts of things, you know, water, land. Um, there, yeah. there was also even a ban on fi fish clear up salmon up to Chief Joe. Mm -hmm. So it affects us when you have those kind of damaging things happen around the world. Um, Mother Earth, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And so it affects us here, right here. I know Cobbles were talking about uh, the fish ban a while back at Chief Joe. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's a that's a great idea. We'll have to check up on, on that and see what's been going on. So moving right along on our final story, we have, I think, is a pretty neat story. And we take our sources. We go out and try and get these from all over the place. And this particular one came from... Uh, prevention.com of all places. Um, just kind of a neat little story here. It's about a white bison. A beautiful and rare white bison has been spotted in Missouri's Ozark Mountains. The calf was named Dakota, which means friend to everybody. The story by uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole Natale, February 12th, 2021. A white bison has been spotted at Dogwood Canyon Nature Park in Lampy, Missouri. The birth of the animal is a rare but conservative say that the sighting is becoming more common thanks to crossbreeding efforts. The two-year-old calf was named Dakota, a Sioux word meaning friend to everyone. A, su a surprising new guest has arrived at Dogwood Canyon uh, Nature Park in Missouri's Ozark Mountains, a rare white bison calf named Dakota, a uh, Sioux word meaning friend to everyone. He was born on a private ranch and came to live with the herd of bison currently roaming Dogwood Canyon earlier this year. Jeremy Hinkle, director of, of wildlife at Dogwood Canyon, tells Prevention.com that a white bison's birth, once an, excep an exceptionally rare occurrence, with some estimating that only one in 10 million bison were ever born white. 
However, you may now encounter one of these majestic creatures thanks to the work of, of conservationists. Though still rare, the phenomenon is more common due to crossbreeding with cattle as a result of attempts by ranchers to save the species from extinction after the populations plummeted to only a few hundred between 1830 and 1900. Wildlife experts are thrilled about Dakota's presence at Dogwood Canyon for many reasons. The bison shows the, dedica the delicate balance of conservation that saved the species from near extinction, uh, Hinkle says. Dakota also serves as a visual example of the meaning of white buffalo in native cultures, especially in plains tribes. That's a really neat article. I'm going to show this picture of Dakota one more time. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, the reason I think it's really cool is because the last time I heard about a white buffalo, uh, some somebody poached it, and it wasn't a you know it wasn't a good thing to hear. And I was just like, wow, you know, here we wait, you know, and somebody wants it on their wall or something. But um, this is neat. Happy to see it. Um, HappyPrevention.com covered this. Um, but yeah, we'll have to definitely keep it up. Well, uh, prevention has a, a healing process called the White Bison uh, Society that helped get people whole philosophy um, as as part of the uh, Lakota culture. The White Bison um, has a very significant meaning, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and um, so, yeah, a, a shout out uh, to our White Bison. So, folks, uh, again, we want to thank you for joining us. Please send us your ideas um, and uh, reach out to us with story ideas. We'll, we're listening. Um, and like and subscribe. Yeah. Uh, tell send your it, friends. Send, send us your friends and family, especially if they're living abroad or if they're living in different parts of the U.S. where they can't keep up with everything going on here. And uh, we're, we're happy to hear from them. We're happy to hear from you. Um, and until next time. Nemeth, Nemeth, Weechdemen.